Good morning, afternoon, evening, or whenever you're listening to this. Greetings, listeners and fairy tale enthusiasts. Welcome to the very first episode of a new podcast, Beauties and Beasts. My name's DF, and I will say this outright. I love fairy tales. I know what you're thinking. How can a grown woman of 23 still love children's stuff? Well, in actuality, fairy tales can be a lot darker and deeper than people give them credit for. And I mean really dark. Uh, Come on. Red Riding Hood gets eaten, literally eaten, by a wolf. Hansel and Gretel. Children are turned into gingerbread. And then eaten. Almost eaten. Sleeping Beauty is in danger of getting eaten by her mother-in-law. What is with people getting eaten in these stories? Why do we read these to kids? Well, as gory as these stories are, they were written for children because they teach very valuable life lessons. For instance, Red Riding Hood, don't talk to strangers. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, don't take food from strangers. Hansel and Gretel, don't eat a stranger's gingerbread candy house. You get the gist, stranger danger. But of all the fairy tales in the world, my favorite, if it wasn't already obvious by the title of this podcast, is Beauty and the Beast. Why? Well, that's the whole point of this podcast. A lot of it has to do with my professor, Jamey Rohrer, who taught a college seminar on this subject, and the textbook for that seminar, The Meanings of Beauty and the Beast by Jerry Griswold. Note that I will be referencing information from that handbook a lot. Not only will I be talking about the fairy tale Beauty and the Beast, but its many versions and adaptations over the years. And maybe every now and then some other fairy tales. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we can delve into all the different versions of the story, we must first answer the question, what makes a Beauty and the Beast story? One of the reasons Beauty and the Beast is so popular is because over the millennia, it has been retold and rewritten in various forms of media. From books, to television, to film, to video games, to television series based on video games. The simplest way to define Beauty and the Beast is that it's a story of a beautiful character falling in love with a, um, not-so-beautiful character. Versions of the story even date far as back as ancient Greece, making it truly, quoting from Disney's version, a tale as old as time. In ancient Greek mythology, the gods would often, you know, have flings with mortals by turning into animals from bulls to swans, though I'm really not sure how this attracted the girls. One myth that resembles the mainstream Beauty and the Beast story we have today the most is the story of Eros, or Cupid, and his wife Psyche. We will get into that myth a lot more, though, in another episode. While there have been many different takes and variations on this tale, they all seem to share certain characteristics. Uh, Firstly, if the title didn't already suggest this, a Beauty and the Beast story must involve two main characters, one representing the beauty and one representing the beast. The beauty, of course, has to be beautiful. Physically, sometimes, personality-wise. The social status can vary. She can be the daughter of a miller or a princess even. And I say she because oftentimes the beauty is depicted as a female, and oftentimes she is human. Though there have been versions where the beauty character can be male. By the way, if any of you have seen Beauty and the Beast stories with non-binary characters, then please let me know because I'd really like to see them. The Beast character is, well, he's kind of beastly, which mostly means ugly. Sometimes he can be human and just really, really hideous, at least physically. Or oftentimes he's of a different species, and I say he because most of the time he is a male. Though sometimes it can be female. Sometimes even it's a female and a female, or a male and a male. Sometimes a beast's deformity is caused by something literal, like an accident, or he was born that way, or it could be caused by a magic spell. And he actually used to be a beautiful person, but then, for some reason, somebody thought that he would make a better beast. Another thing to note is that the relationship is not always romantic, though it is the most common. But sometimes the Beauty and the Beast relationship portrayed can be platonic or familial. Sometimes the relationship is one-sided, which is kind of sad. Sometimes it's a mix between platonic and romantic and familial. I actually just recently watched an anime with all three. Ah, more on that in another episode. The original version of Beauty and the Beast, and by that I mean the first of its kind to actually possess that title, was a over 100-page novel written by Madame Gabrielle Suzanne de Villeneuve in 1740. 
Since it was written in French, the title was actually La Belle et la Bête, which literally translates to The Beauty and the Beast. The shortened, more popular version that we know today was written by Jean-Marie La Prince de Beaumont, published in Le Magasin des Enfants, or The Magazine for Children, in 1756. Uh, this was before copyright was a thing, so she was allowed to do this. But Beaumont's version is pretty much the standard skeleton for any Beauty and the Beast adaptation we've seen, so hers is the one we're going to focus on mostly. Another aspect of Beauty and the Beast stories is that they seem to follow a five-act structure. To explain these five acts in detail, we're going to use Beaumont's version as an example. Please note that there have been many edits and rewrites to Beaumont's version, so you may not read the same details in a picture book or on the internet. I'm just going to give you the gist of the story. So Act 1 starts with the introduction of the characters. And these characters introduced in Act 1 can be the beauty, the beast, or both. Sometimes Act 1 will tell us how the beast came to be a beast, or what beauty is doing before she comes into contact with the beast. Beaumont's story starts off with a wealthy merchant with three daughters and three sons. The youngest daughter is named Belle, which is French for beauty. Yeah, that's right, Disney did not make that name up. Belle's two older sisters are described as being uppity and selfish and totally materialistic, while Belle is more humble than sweet-natured and really loves to read books. Huh, Disney really liked this story, didn't they? And then something happens for the merchant to lose his entire fortune, and they are forced to move to a small country house. Belle tries to make the best of things and keep house, while her sisters are just lazy and whine about their misfortune. Villeneuve's novel has a bit more backstory about how the beast became a beast. Apparently the prince was seduced by an evil fairy, who then turned him into a beast because he rejected her, and Belle was apparently the daughter of a king and a fairy, and then placed in the merchant's care in order to protect her from the evil fairy. I can see why Beaumont left out this part about Belle being a changeling because it doesn't really seem relevant later in the story. And now we go into Act 2, which describes how the beauty comes into contact with the beast. And oddly enough, this mostly happens through the father. So one day, the merchant receives word that one of his lost ships has come into port. All the children think this means that they're going to become rich again. Before the merchant leaves, he asks his children what to bring from the town. While his older daughters ask for all these fine clothes and jewelry, Belle only asks for a rose, since none grow in her garden. If you've seen the new Disney version of Beauty and the Beast, this is where that part came from. Unfortunately, when the merchant reaches his ship, he's lost all his goods, and he heads home empty-handed. But then he gets lost in the woods and comes upon the beast's castle. There he finds food, a warm bed, and clothes that are placed by invisible servants. And before he leaves, he finds roses in the garden. And remembering his promise to Belle, he steals a rose. Here's a lesson, parents. No matter how much you love your children, don't steal for them. It's bad role modeling. Then this beast appears and... He's really not described very well in the story, so there have been a lot of interpretations of what he looks like, and threatens to kill the merchant unless one of his daughters takes his place out of her own free will within three months. That's kind of merciful, allowing him time to say goodbye to his children. And the beast gives the merchant his horse and some treasure for his children so that whatever should happen, the children will at least be provided for. And Belle, thinking that this was all her fault for asking for the rose, offers to come in her father's place. And then we go into Act 3, which is the actual interaction between the beauty and the beast. So Belle comes to the castle, and she thinks she is here to die. But in actuality, the beast gives her all this really expensive stuff. A very fancy room, some fine clothes, a library full of books. Yes, yes, this sounds more like the Disney version more and more. And he tells her that she is the master of this house, and he and all his invisible servants are at her beck and call. But there is a catch. The Beast only visits her at dinner, during which, every night, he asks her to marry him. But Belle's like, hey, I hardly know you, so I'm gonna have to pass. He never gets angry at her refusal. He just grows really, really sad. And Belle grows sad, too, because she's missing her father. But over time, she gets more and more used to the Beast, and they start becoming friends. But of course, we can't have happiness forever, which is why we go into Act 4, The Betrayal. And there's almost always a betrayal in almost every one of these Beauty and the Beast stories. In this one, Belle sees in a magic mirror, which was given to her by the Beast, that her father is all alone at home, now that her sisters have married and her brothers have joined the army. Later versions have the father getting sick, and that's why she wants to go home. And the Beast allows her to go home for a week. However, if she does not come back, he will die out of loneliness. 
So Belle comes back to visit her father wearing a gorgeous gown and having all these treasures she's brought back from the Beast's castle. And the sisters grow jealous because they are in very unhappy marriages with their husbands. So they convince her to stay longer by saying that they miss her so much. And because she loves her sisters and is totally oblivious to their plot, she stays longer and eventually forgets about the Beast, but then she dreams of him dying. Yeah, another lesson, kids. In choosing between your family and your friends, just remember which one you made a promise to first. Then we go into Act 5, The Resolution, in which Belle returns to find the Beast dying in the garden. And as he is dying, Belle says that she loves him and she will marry him. And this is enough to break the spell on the Beast and turn him into a handsome prince, and they live happily ever after. Yay! Also, her sisters get turned to stone by a good fairy because they were so wicked. Yay? So now that we've heard the original story, let's think about what it means. Now, Beaumont's purpose behind this story was to prepare young girls for arranged marriages. I know what you're thinking. What? Arranged marriages aren't a thing anymore, most of the time. Well, they were a thing in the 18th century. And while it wasn't always fair to the girls, Beaumont actually was a bit forward-thinking for her time. Arranged marriage can be scary. I mean, you're practically married to somebody you've never really met before. Which is why the husband-to-be in the story is a scary-looking monster. However, the Beast isn't actually that bad a guy. I mean, he did threaten to kill the merchant over a rose, and he did have Belle come so that her father would not die. But the interesting thing about him is that he actually gives Belle a choice. When Belle first comes to the castle, he asks if she comes willingly. I mean, he's not just looking for any girl. He wants a girl who actually wants to be with him. And that's why he does not get super angry every time she rejects him. He doesn't try anything. He doesn't try to put a move on her. He just asks. Momon also provides examples of what young girls should look for in a husband, telling them not to care so much about looks or cleverness, but care about the husband being kind. Okay, just saying, maybe the husband should have a little bit of brains. I mean, you don't want a complete idiot. Not saying he has to be an Einstein, just smart enough to maybe know when no is no. And there have been many interpretations of this story, one of them being a feminist one showing a strong girl with a mind of her own and having some power in a relationship. That she actually has equal say in her relationship with the Beast, if not more. And she's clearly educated if she's reading all the time, and says in the story that the merchant spared no expense on his children's education. The story also shows what happens when girls can, you know, fall to stereotypes and be totally selfish and materialistic. They can be really nasty, and if you are going to be selfish, you might as well just be a statue. Oh boy, that just sounds twisted when you say it aloud. Some people have also found a bit of a homosexual undertone to this story, especially in popular film adaptations like Disney's. Oh yeah, Disney's Beauty and the Beast has homosexual subtext. I will get into that when I talk about the movie in full. Now, it's not a story about a homosexual relationship, but it does portray a relationship that would be seen as beastly. The beast is seen as ugly, therefore the relationship is seen as ugly. But in the end, it turns out to be beautiful. Because love is what makes a relationship beautiful. And then there's a Freudian perspective. That's a story about a girl breaking away from her sexual desire for her father and transferring her sexual desire to her husband. Yeah, this is my least favorite interpretation, Cursey Freud. And here's my personal take on Beauty and the Beast. As an asexual, one who does not experience sexual attraction, I've never really liked fairy tales where the couple falls in love at first sight. And this is one of the few fairy tales where the couple actually falls in love over time. And it's not because they are totally beautiful. I mean, maybe Beast is somewhat attracted to Belle's physical appearance. But that is not what it's all about. It's all about their personalities and how kind they are to each other and the time they spend together. And believe it or not, a lot of people have found it unsatisfying when the Beast turns into a beautiful prince at the end, implying that you have to be same-same in order to be together. I don't always like it either. In some versions, the Beast is more attractive than the man. Weird, I know. But I believe that transformation serves as a metaphor, that true beauty comes from within. It wasn't until Belle saw him as beautiful that he became beautiful. Literally. This fairy tale really helped me with coming to terms with my asexuality because it told me it's okay if you're not physically attracted to people. If you do fall in love with people, it's not because they're beautiful. 
It's because you get along with them. It's because they are good to you or whatever the reason may be. All that matters is what's on the inside. And these various interpretations have led to really beautiful and deep adaptations, bringing new light to the story over and over and over again. If you like this podcast, then send me a message on Podbean or on my YouTube channel, Disney Fanatic 2364 and tell me what versions of Beauty and the Beast or other fairy tales you would like me to analyze in depth. They can be a movie, TV show, comic book, etc., etc., anything you can come up with. Obviously, I'll get to some really big ones like the Disney version, but all in good time. For now, remember, beauty is skin deep, and looks aren't everything. And while fairy tales may get old, they actually don't get old. I'll work on that.